And so the, the rest of the session will be your opportunity to bring up a draft that you already have, iterate on it based on what we've, what we've presented this week, um, and then speak to a, a, an expert about it. So the way that will work is that you'll put up your hand, um, a, a, an expert will come to you, um, and you can chat, ask questions, uh, whatever you want, and then every 10 minutes or so I'll ring a bell just so that um, everyone kind of gets a turn and um, the experts and students are able to each get something valuable from the session. So yeah, let's begin. So yeah, broadly, what is the research proposal? We know that it's kind of a key part of any uh, PhD application, and it's a summary of what work you were going to do in your research. So two to three, three to five years of research, depending on where you're doing your PhD. And essentially, it has to be something new that has not done before, that has not been done before, and it needs to propose something better, um, more accurate, or more efficient. So on Tuesday night, we made quite a clear distinction between what we mean by a research proposal, which is something more specific to UK and European and kind of rest of the world, institutions in the rest of the world, whereas a statement of purpose is something that's quite specific to, to US institutions. And so I'll quickly go over just a kind of structured um, a way you can think about structuring your research proposal, and then I'll also go on to what George uh, spoke about on Tuesday night on um, how to structure a, a statement of purpose. So those are the two, the two alternatives. You can choose whichever one best suits, you, whatever works best for you in terms of what you work on in this session. Um, but I'll just go through them both here. So essentially for a research proposal, you want to be looking for three main sections. Uh, the first section will be answering the question why, motivating why you want to do this research. What is the big picture problem? What approaches have been done? What is missing in them? You'll then move on to answering, well, the question what? What is the thing that you're proposing? What is your research idea? And um, what is it that you're going to be investigating as, as the solution to this problem? And then, and then the, third, the, the third section is answering the question how, giving some description on the first steps you would take, for example, some data collection, what experiments you would initially run, resources you need, potential obstacles. So that's that. And then for the uh, statement of purpose structure, um, I don't know if George, you actually want to, you want to maybe take take uh, take over this. Hello. Is this one? Yeah. Hello. Okay. okay so um, this statement of purpose is actually really free form. You can kind of say whatever you want. But what I encourage my undergrads and master students who are applying for PhDs to write is um, so these are generally two pages. First page uh, is a general introduction of you and the area that you want to study and why. Sorry, first paragraph. They can be quite short. You can just say, hi, my name is George. I really want to study reinforcement learning because I think X, Y, and Z. And then paragraphs 2 to N minus 1 should describe your background, all the cool and interesting projects that you've done, um, experiences that led you to want to do research, um, and especially specific examples of where you did things or exhibited the attributes of a researcher. So if you sort of tell the story of like that time you built a system and then it didn't work, and then you had to figure out a way around it, or you implemented something that was on paper and um, it worked, but then you got curious about why it broke on certain examples, and then you dug in a little bit further, right? If you can, you can kind of um, show, but not, not tell, that you have these attributes, you can have specific examples about these things. That's really helpful, because it provides evidence that you're, you've got the kind of characteristics of a researcher. And then the last paragraph is a swappable paragraph, um, where you say, I want to go to your university because, Okay, so you say, I want to study at Brown because, and then you mention specific um, faculty members, and you should bold their names so that the, they're not going to miss that they're in the statement, and then you should have a sentence or two about what they do that indicates that you understand what they do and why you think it would be a good fit. Okay, so um, so uh, my students generally find it hard to think about what to say here. It doesn't have to be like, I wrote a paper and I, and I, and I got it accepted, look at me. It can be more like, you know, I've done a series of projects and these developed my interests, and let me tell you about why they were cool and interesting and hard, and, and what I learned and how I failed and how I recovered, uh, and what things I had to do that were creative. Um, so, so and, and this is really like a narrative. You should kind of tell your story. I find that that works best. Okay. Cool. Can I add a... Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe one, one, this is fantastic. And one, one thing I would also add for US institutions is some, somewhere here I'm reading from Match. 
So I want to know whether your research is a good fit for the sort of thing that I do. And there's an art to being specific enough that I feel like, oh, we could work together, but not so specific that nobody else will think that your work is interesting about me. So make sure that that goes somewhere in this art as well. Cool. All right, so as you probably got a sense from, from, from these two different, let's say, forms of um, uh, research, you know, looking at the research proposal versus the statement of purpose, the research proposal is much more forward-looking. What am I going to do in the next three to five years in my research? Whereas the statement of purpose has a much more backward-looking, what have I done up until now and why is that a good reason why I should join your lab as a, as a PhD student? Um, so, Laura uh, wrote down some, some nice tips so, um, to help you kind of begin thinking about this. So, the first thing, and I hope the exercises on Tuesday night were useful in finding the problem or the, the research problem that you're passionate about. Start by reading papers. Um, obviously, ground yourself quite firmly in the literature. Know what has been done before, what is cutting edge, where are the problems. Um, brainstorm ideas. Don't be afraid. Start by writing in bullet points and flesh them out later. So maybe that's something that we can actually do in this session, is that if you have an idea in mind, you have something that you know you want to you pursue, start by writing that, those ideas in bullet points and then call over an expert and get them to sort of give you feedback on that structure, on, on those bullet points, and then kind of go back and maybe flesh them out a little bit more. Um, and then discuss your ide ideas with, potential supervisor, with your potential supervisor, but more broadly just um, an expert in that field, somebody with a bit more experience than you. Their feedback can, can, can be very useful. Oh yeah, that's kind of summarized again in this, in this first topic, in this first point. Um, yeah, some other ones, just general, these slides will be made available online. Identify good conferences and labs, just to make sure you're not missing out on any papers. Find a mentor and start with the bits that you find easy to write, then tackle the hard ones. So these are all very general points, but maybe they'll be useful to you um, in this session. So yeah, that was just a very brief summary of what we discussed on Tuesday night. And so we'll now start with the, um, with the interactive part, I guess. Um, so how this will work, as I said at the beginning, but for those who are late in joining, uh, you will stay seated, uh, kind of working away on, on, on your drafts. Um, and when you have a full draft or your bullet points, raise your hand and an expert will come to you. I've asked everyone to kind of be seated by subject area, so um, uh, yeah, hopefully people are mo mostly grouped up, but the experts have on their, on their, on a sticker on their uh, t-shirts what their area of expertise is, so if you want to call over someone who's specific to your area of expertise, uh, discuss the draft with an expert, and then every 10 minutes or so I'll r make a sound, ring a bell, and that'll just encourage the experts to kind of move on to the next person so that everyone gets a chance. All right, so thanks, thanks everyone for joining and uh, begin. <laughs> yeah, Benji? Put up the seating plan again. Yeah, I'll put up the seating plan. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it's clear for everyone, but maybe come close to the front if you can't read it, or I can call it out. <laughs> yeah, so these directions are based on if you're facing the front of the room. <laughs> Like to teach the robot to farm and it gets a point for eating an apple, all the stuff in between is not explained. And finally, we have this problem of stability, which is that um, you can't explore however you would like on the robot in the same way that you can in the software. You can't wave your arms around and smash into stuff until you find the solution almost by accident and then try and go backwards. Robots are expensive, robots break. You can't generally get it to do more than a thousand things before it falls over the first time. It's just like your own body. When you're learning to play tennis, you don't start by twitching all your muscles. That would be crazy. And thrashing around on the floor. Okay? So we can't have these kind of really, really long learning curves where you start off with completely random actions, where you could do damage to the physical plant, uh, and then take like 10,000 uh, episodes to learn something. It has to be fast, it has to be safe. So as a consequence, the um, vast majority of your mapping from uh, those things to the value of taking that action, and then you want to pick the action that maximizes Q for a particular state. 
Okay, so normally in reinforcement learning, in a continuous state space, you have some parameter vector. Your job is to change this parameter vector so that your Q function is accurate. And then um, what you want to do when you actually take an action is just pick the maximum A. This is not how we typically do things though in robotics. Um, in robotics, policies are often better than value functions. So what do I mean by policy? I mean let's directly write down a parameterized family of policies that the robot can search through to solve its problem. So now instead of parameterizing the Q function, we're going to forget about the Q function and we're going to parameterize pi, the robot's control policy. Okay, so that's uh, you input uh, the state, you get out directly a real valued set of actions and then it's got some theta that you get to choose in order to maximize return. And we're going to search over this theta. So we're going to search directly in policy space. Now this is a very important thing, uh, decision. It's very important to understand why we do this. Um, so let's go back to the, the key challenges. It doesn't actually help with data scarcity, so ignore that one. It helps with continuous states and actions because the problem with the QSA if, is if S is continuous and A is continuous, you have to try and do an optimization over A to find the maximum of Q. So you're given S, you input it into this thing, and now you're doing, a, you're doing a, an optimization over a real value vector A to find the maximum value. And that's unhappy, we don't like doing that. Um, it doesn't help with sparse, sparse reward functions, but it does help with stability. It is very often the case that we can write down a safe class of policies for the robot. Or we can write down a class of policies for the robot that contain our knowledge about the task. Okay, so for example, um, if we're thinking about kicking, we're trying to get the robot to learn to kick, and we know the kick looks like this, but we just don't know how fast and how far and how much momentum, we could write down a program that kicks and has those things as, as state variables, and then there's no way to exit that space. The robot can't hurt itself, it can't fall over, it can't thrash around, it's got a kick, it, you're just choosing like how hard or in what direction, okay? So generally speaking, what we do to get around data scarcity and stability is we insert structure into the class of policies that make them reasonable. You are only searching in reasonable policy space and whatever background knowledge you have about the robot you can, you can put into that policy space. It's much easier to put structure into the policy space than it is to put it into Q. It's much easier to say, okay, um, the robot's going to learn to juggle, its arms should never smash into each other uh, and um, they should stay roughly in this area. That's very easy. It's extremely hard to write down a Q function where the maximum happens to have that property. So these are the reasons that we tend to do uh, policy search based reinforcement learning. Just a different class of algorithms where instead of first learning Q and then deriving your policy from Q, you search directly in this policy space. Okay. So what we do there is we represent the policy directly, pi SA theta. Uh, maps from Rn, that's the number of things in S, um, uh, and R, uh, uh, M. so you're fixing, you're fixing your parameter uh, vector theta, it's mapping from your N dimensional state space and your M dimensional action space to a distribution, to a probability, so it gives you a probability of actions, fixing states, okay? And the idea there is you're just going to have theta as your parameter vector. And your objective function is exactly what it was like in normal reinforcement learning, you want to maximize the sum of returns. So what's the easiest way to do that? Who's done an optimization? What's the absolute first optimization algorithm that you would try if you had a function, it's got some parameters, and you want to maximize something? Gradient descent. Gradient descent. the second one you try. What's the first one you try? Yeah. Sorry, what search? Random search. Random search. Yes, well, close. So hill climbing. Hill climbing is a little better than random search, right? Because the thing about gradient descent is you have to calculate a gradient. Um, with hill climbing, let's, let's say that you have a policy, like I've written down a program for kicking, and it's got five variables in it. It's not clear how you can get the, the, uh, the derivative of that program with respect to those variables. But what you can do is you can just sample some um, theta values near your current best theta, write down the rewards, and then move your current best theta towards uh, the one that had the highest reward. It's like the world's simplest search algorithm of climbing. Um, interestingly, a large fraction of the current state of the art in policy search does this. Okay, so let me show you an example. I like this example, it's old, 
but it explains why we might care about um, writing down classes of policies. Okay, so do you know, does, do people know about RoboCup? This is this competition where robots play soccer against each other. And there was a long time in RoboCup, see one of the downsides about these, um, about these uh, metrics, about these tournaments is, for a long time, whoever had the best gate in RoboCup won. So there were like whole armies of grad students hand engineering the best way to move their little robots around. Whoever could walk the fastest one just every time, and, and that was the dominating thing. So what Peter Stone and Nate Cole decided to do was apply learning to this problem to see if they could learn the best gait. But they know something about gaits on robots, right? They knew, for example, that uh, with the Sony Ibo, it was better for it to walk on its, sort of like on its uh, elbows. Turns out that that's better on that platform, and everyone had tried it the other way, and this is much, much better. And they also knew, roughly speaking, that when the robot was walking, its feet should move roughly in an ellipse. So what they did is they built a program with 12 parameters. Uh, the parameters are like the front locus of the ellipse, the rear locus of the ellipse, the locus length, the locus skew, the height of the front of the body, the height of the rear of the body, the time each foot takes to move through its locus, the fraction time each foot spends on the ground. Now the thing about this is this robot's not going to thrash around or do anything random. You can pick a, a terrible set of parameters for these, this policy and it will still, roughly speaking, form an ellipse and walk around. Okay, so there's no threat to the robot, and you know you're in, you're in a good set of policies. Right? And you also know you only have a 12 dimensional parameter vector to optimize. Okay. So here is uh, pre optimization, the world's best IBO gate. <laughs> this is the result of, ten, of decades of grad student effort. Okay. <laughs> Okay, post optimization. Total robot time is about an hour. Okay, so what they did is they just um, they would just try random theaters, have the robot walk back and forth, time how fast it was. That's your reward function, and then you just do hill climbing on those theaters. No robots were broken. Nothing crazy happened. It's all in this nice, clean parameter space. You can get a little bit more advanced and interesting with that. Um, uh, uh, these two algorithms are from 2010 and 2011, pi and pi squared, and essentially they're similar. Um, here's an example of um, Katharina Mulling initializing learning for this problem called ball and cup by just showing the robot what to do and then trying to optimize uh, the resulting program is called a dynamic motion primitive. That's after one attempt to reproduce that trajectory. There's 15, after 15 attempts, it's not bad actually, 25 attempts. So that's 100 total robot executions. Now, two things to bear in mind. One thing to bear in mind is that you start with a demonstration, so it did not start with something random. And the second thing is that it uses a constrained policy class called a dynamic motion primitive, which represents how you would do dynamic motions. And that's, that was one of the major outputs of Stefan Charles' lab. Okay, so, so that finding that policy class that applied to many robot problems took a long time and a lot of research effort. So Jan Peters, because this is the kind of guy he is, uh, went home for Christmas at the end of this, found all of his young cousins, and made them learn this task, and timed how many times they learned this task. Okay, so 100, 100 trials is about how long it takes a five-year-old uh, to be able to learn this task. So that's human level performance, roughly speaking. Which I think is pretty cool. Okay, second algorithm that you might try is the one that was raised in the beginning. It's, uh, it's conjugate gradient, right? Gradient descent. Okay, so how can we apply that in policy search land? Um, well, the idea is that we want to compute the derivative of the return with respect to theta. These are the parameters in the policy. Okay. 
So this is the um, this is the thing that we want to do. If we can compute this, we can just we can just ascend it. Um, and there is a magical piece of math due to Rich Sutton. Many things are due to Rich Sutton, and this is one of them, um, which says that you can write down this gradient. Uh, this is just the, uh, in terms of pieces of math. You don't need to worry about the equation. Let's just think about the pieces inside it. This is the distribution of estates that you see when you execute. So you just get that from sampling. This is the de uh, derivative of the policy with respect to its own parameters. Okay, so you have to have a differentiable policy for this to work. Uh, and then this is the Q function that you all know and love. There's something special about this Q function though. The Q function uh, is actually a linear Q function and it's linear in, basis, in uh, the basis functions of uh, d pi by d theta. So, if you have a robot with like a zillion degrees of freedom and you wrote down a 10-dimensional policy class, then this is a, is a projection of the Q function down to a 10-dimensional linear space. So you get the advantage of the compressed thing in learning this Q function. You don't have to learn an accurate Q function, you just have to learn a Q function linear only in as many parameters as you have thetas. Uh, you can learn that very quickly and then you put that inside here, and that's your gradient. Um, and then you ascend that gradient. Um, so here is a fun video of something like that happening. This is from Scott Kindersmeyer, his PhD. Okay, so he had this balancing robot, and he wanted to get it to be um, to recover from being smacked by um, stuff. Okay, so what he did was he ran a policy optimization by smacking it with this glove, which had a little sensor on it many, many, many times, and, and what it's searching through is, is the space of parameterized arm motion. So it's sticking out its arm to try and recover, right? If someone pushes you from behind, you stick out your arms. Right? So what this is doing is policy gradient over the arm motions to be able to recover uh, from perturbations, from being pushed. <coughs> that's before learning, that's after learning, and you can see that it makes a major difference. And it also turns out that it generalizes nicely. So uh, it's a short robot. This is why it has to be, you know, people push it around a little bit. Um, Scott works at, hum at, um, at uh, Boston Dynamics now, which may not surprise you given that he's beating up a robot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick detour, um, uh, something that I think is cool that you can do with reinforcement learning, uh, is instead of learning one motor skill that you get to use once, you might imagine that you <coughs> would want to learn a reusable motor skill that you can apply in different situations. Like let's say you were learning to play soccer, you learn to kick the ball at one particular, you know, at the goal from one particular place. You might instead imagine that you could learn to kick it, you know, into the goal when the goal's over there, and then once when the goal's over there, and then once when the goal is over there, uh, and then save up all these things and be able to on demand produce a kicking skill that will kick at the goal wherever it happens to be. Okay, so this is the notion of a parameterized skill where you have some toss parameters tau that the agent gets to choose and then inputs, <coughs> it gets theta that's a function of those tau. Okay, so the, so the, the things that parameterize the policy are a function of tau, and then you run the resulting task-specific policy. And the idea here is a single task that solves a, a parameterized family of problems. So you don't have to do relearning every time you do something like that. Um, so here is some work that I did with Bruno Castro da Silva on uh, building such a skill. Okay, so I apologize in advance for the creepiness of this robot. Um, it's learning to throw a ball to hit a, uh, to hit a bottle. So this takes a while. We have a parameterized throwing skill. It's learning exactly how to parameterize that throwing skill for this ball. Eventually it hits the bottle in one place. Then we make a train in another place. And yet another place. And yet another place. And yet another place. And after it's done all that, it can on demand hit new targets. Not all the time, it's going to miss one of them. I think it misses this one. But on demand, it can hit a new target by throwing. Okay, so you've learned like n samples of the, of the, of the parameter. 
and then you're able to roll out however many new parameters you'd like. Which is pretty cool. I think that's like a you know one of the ways that we get around the heavy uh, um, sample complexity of all of this. The other thing that Bruno showed is that you can do active task selection. So you can practice which towers uh, you want to select so as to learn the skill the fastest. This is actually a characteristic of expert performance by athletes. If you if you look at what the difference is between a between a world class athlete and an amateur, one of the major differences is a world class athlete pays careful attention to what they're good at and adjusts their uh, practice routine very carefully to to improve in the areas where they need improvement and where they think they can improve. They don't just practice randomly. They don't just do the same stuff. They actually are very thoughtful about where their skill level is. Um, so we thought we could apply the same um, sort of problem to parameterized skill learning, like you can learn that you're good at throwing the ball over there, but you're not so good at throwing it over there, or so good at throwing it over there. And if you have a distribution over tasks, like we, here's a distribution over the parameters, you can kind of actively practice so that um, in expectation, you're able to answer the query from those parameters uh, effectively. After we are able to learn these things, then there's a question of how the agent should learn which task parameters to pick at which particular state. So this is some work um, with Warwick Masson from WITS, which is a very nice paper, um, uh, where you can take those parameter skill, parameterized skills and then learn to choose how to parameterize them. So here is an agent um, learning, it's got a kicking and a distance skill, learning to get around uh, a goalkeeper. Here is an agent that can jump at a particular speed or a particular height, learning to get through a little maze. Okay, so back to policy search. What we've seen in the last couple of years is we've seen a combination of policy search and deep learning. Okay, so it's called deep policy search. It started out called DDPG, um, but there, this kind of interesting robotics uh, take on it was from Sergey Levine's group, where uh, where they applied learning from pixels directly to torques on the robot. Okay, this is super exciting because you don't have to build a special policy class or anything like that. It still uses a parameter trust policy because the outputs are talks to the robot, but you don't have to put in a lot of engineering and a lot of effort into it. Um, and so the input is this RGB image that goes through a bunch of stuff and eventually goes to motor talks. Um, it comes with quite an elaborate uh, architecture. Um, the thing to notice about this is that uh, there's a little bit of not... Um, there's a little bit of stuff happening that doesn't, isn't sort of counted in the learning process, but that maybe should be. So, automatically collecting visual pose data is a kind of way of learning what the robot's own arm looks like in the scene. Okay, so that's not part of the, of the learning task of like learning to pick something up or put it down. It kind of has to be pre-done in order to pre-train the network. Um, and they have to learn initial local controllers. Uh, first, <coughs> then there's a pose CNN, which is just a just a normal deep net, and then this is the kind of online part where they collect samples, they do um, policy gradient, they optimize the local controllers, and they and they collect samples up again. So these visual motor poli policies are really exciting. Like here is a robot learning to put a cube in a in a hole directly from pixels. So you can move it around and it's able to kind of generalize. Right? Here is a robot uh, learning to use a, a hammer to pull out a, um, we're using a hammer to just sort of catch a peg. Okay, so what's exciting about these things is that you get the power of deep nets and you can put them directly into your learned policy. What's not exciting about these things is that I think that particular network had something like 22,000 open parameters. So you have to apply a lot of stuff to get around the fact that you need to fill in 22,000 parameters in the amount of time it should take you to learn like a, a task to pick up a block. And the way that that's done is using a bunch of pre-training pre, pre techniques, like visual pre-training, 
and then and then you know pre-learning where the robot's arm is going to be and all that kind of stuff, um, and then you can learn these motor tasks. I will say that at the moment it is still the case that uh, motor tasks learned this way are noticeably simpler than the ones that are learned with parameterized policies, but they don't have the same amount of engineering required. They're also not provably safe. Right? The robot could do something crazy, and you just hope it doesn't. So there's kind of like a dilemma or a discussion going on now in robotics about um, about should we keep going for thinking about structured policies uh, with more or less structure in them, but that are small and contain what we think is reasonable for a robot, or should we just abandon that and do deep end-to-end -end stuff and try and make that more efficient? Um, and and that's just going to have to hash out over time. We're just going to have to see that there's this question of like how more flexible can the structured policy people get and how more sample efficient can the deep net people get and one of them is going to hit some critical boundary first uh, and then they win. Okay, so that's that's new and exciting and come talk to me about what I think about that later when I'm not on camera. Um, so, but it's like an open scientific question, right, as of today, which one is the best thing to do? I'm going to talk a little bit about model-based RL because um, Whenever people do reinforcement learning on a robot, the first thing they think about is, well, I don't have many samples, so obviously instead of trying to do reinforcement learning directly, I should instead learn a model, and then I should do policy search over that model. Um, and uh, um, it turns out that at least when applied to reinforcement learning, that usually doesn't work. So this is the first thing that most of us tried. Um, we thought, okay, um, we'll learn a model, and I think I'm going to talk more about that later. Um, and we'll just get some get some sample points and uh, like sample executions, state action, reward, state action. Okay, and then we'll learn this forward model, and then we'll do planning with this forward model. Okay, that's model based RL. Uh, it seems like a natural thing to do, um, and you get this procedure that looks roughly like get some transition data, learn a model, run reinforcement learning on samples from that model to convergence and repeat. And we think that this is a reasonable thing to do because it's much easier to learn a transition model than to learn a policy because supervised learning is easier than reinforcement learning. Okay, so every new grad student, when I was a grad student, this was the first thing they were like, of course, we should do robotics this way. Um, uh, but but this, this has not worked for a long time until relatively recently, um, at least in the reinforcement learning setting. Um, and the reason that it hasn't worked is because this model is never exactly right. So you learn, uh, you learn a Ford model of how the robot works in the world, and then you take that Ford model and you believe it. And then you specialize your learned policy to that Ford model, which is not right. And then when you run the thing, right, you assume its predictions are correct, um, but it's not correct because it's learned. And, and when you run the thing, you find that the policy is totally brittle uh, um, because of those uh, uh, model errors. Okay, it's not an accurate representation of what happens in the world, but the thing that planned using it assumed it was, and things go pear-shaped as soon as you run it in real life. And so the breakthrough, the recent breakthrough that fixed a lot of this stuff, um, is due to Mark Dysonroth actually, who you all have seen probably because he lectured earlier, and and he calls it Pulco. I like to think of it as as Bayesian policy search, where what you do is you integrate over that distribution of models. So you don't take a point model, you instead take a distribution over models and you find the policy that performs well in expectation over that distribution. What that means is that you're taking the uncertainty in your learned model seriously. You're not believing that it's exactly right and that it's a point model. You're taking the uncertainty seriously, you're integrating over that uncertainty, and you're searching inside that integration for a good policy. And so I'd like to show off Mark's video. Um, so this is from scratch. Right? There's, no, uh, there's no initialization or anything like that. And this is uh, this may look familiar to you if you're a reinforcement learning researcher. It looks like something called cart pole, but this is a real, right? So real cart pole. So here it's trying to lift that thing up and balance it vertically. This is trial number one. And Mark corrects it, brings it back. It's got a fixed number of seconds to try and balance. What's happening is it's learning a model of the. Of the of the dynamics of the agent, Bayesian model, and then while he walks back and forth, it's optimizing a policy for that model in real time.
<laughs> What's interesting though is because it's, because it's optimizing um, with respect to its learned distribution, it's getting the data that narrows down the distribution in just the right way. Um, to be able to make its transition model more and more accurate around where the policy should be. That's pretty close. Now Mark is just going to mess with it here for a second. <laughs> okay, so that's 17 seconds of experience. Six trials, which is like dropping multiple zeros of anything that you could do before that. So there was a good 10 or 15 year period where everyone knew that this was the right thing to do, but couldn't get it to work. And they couldn't get it to work because they weren't basing about it. They didn't take the uncertainty in the learn model seriously. Okay, so people have also started to think about deep models. This is a recent paper where um, you learn uh, the transition dynamics using a deep network. And then um, they call this the imagination core, which, yeah, I guess you could do that. <laughs> if you want. Um, but it's a forward, learn forward model, like all other learn forward models. We have words for those, we should keep them. Um, and what it does is it learns a policy and then it does rollouts over those policies and then it does. Um, uh, it does um, policy search. You get out of pi and a V optimized over those policies. So um, you get uh, this is um, this is the thing we have to move blocks out of the way, and it's kind of rolling out various things it could do in the future, and it's finding the one with the highest value so that it's able to kind of get around. Right. So it's able to do this like mix of learning and planning, but it's doing it directly in pixel space. So that's, that's relatively new work. People haven't quite got this to work yet, as far as, they, as well as they should have, but it's a very promising direction. Still takes a long time to learn stuff from pixels, but now you're learning forward model. Supervised learning is easier than reinforcement learning, so, so it works better than before. Okay. This is reward with their learn model. This is reward. Uh, uh, if it's done directly. And this is how much extra reward, um, extra performance you get if you're able to do uh, further planning using the learn model. Okay, so if you can do five steps ahead, you do this well, three steps ahead, you do this well, one step ahead, you do that well. Okay, so, so to just switch topics a bit. Um, so learning from demonstration, there's been a ton of work in, in, in something called learning from demonstration. Um, So, oh, sorry, yes. Um, can I ask a question before you go on to this? Sorry, sure. I was not a reinforcement learning person, but mm -hmm. just to make sure I understand. So, okay, so you have your initial function Q, and then you reparameterize this using this function pi, which is your policy, right? And then you constrain, so you're basically constraining Q using parameters theta. Is that correct? Well, well it, it's that, it's actually normally that we learn Q in order to create pi, and now we're removing the intermediate step of, of learning Q, and we're Parameterizing policy pi directly. Okay, so, but then we do, we do a Bayesian search over the parameters theta. Yes. So then could you not just do a Bayesian search over Q? Like, why do you do the reparameterization? You could. So, um, it's because, really, it's for two reasons. One, it's much easier to constrain pi at, than Q. No, no, but, but, but actually, the way that reinforcement learning is done is we usually focus on Q, but pi is actually the primary object. 
So, so it's not that you, it's not that Q is the thing you want to learn, it's that Pi is really the thing you want to learn. Usually we learn Q as an intermediate thing. So, Yes. And that's represented by your function. Um, yeah, so pi is the thing that represents the actions that you could take for a particular state. So that's easy to constrain. Q talks about the relative value of actions A under states S. So if, if what you wanted to do is you wanted to say, let's say, for example, um, you always only wanted to be able to execute a particular action when the state's an even number. It's very easy to write in pi. You just, you know, you just say whenever S is this, don't do A. But if you wanted to write that, if you wanted to create a Q such that that never happened, you'd have to ensure that the value of S A for the other A's is higher than it is for the, um, the A that you want to disavow. So you have to like, you have to like manipulate Q so that it never returns that particular A. It's kind of like a roundabout. You can do it, and, and I'm sure mathematically there's an equivalence, but it's much harder to think about the structure of, of that thing, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's, it's easier to write down constraints on the policy directly in the policy than it is in the, in the kind of evaluation of how good actions are under the policy. Um, the other reason is because pi can directly output a real valued action vector, whereas if we had Q, we'd have to search for the A that maximizes QSA for a given S, which is a pain. Yeah, you can still do that. You could do that, yeah. People do do that. Um, it just feels icky, so, um, at least I think it feels icky, so that's why I avoid it. Okay. Um, okay, learning from demonstration. Last part. Okay, so there's a lot of this in robotics. There's a reason that um, we do learning from demonstrations because maybe learning motor skills from scratch is unnecessarily hard. You almost never do that. You almost never invent a motor skill knowing nothing about it except some like arbitrary reward function. Remember when you learned to play tennis the first time? You've seen someone hit a tennis bat, you know, hit a tennis ball. It is not the case that you started by waving around your tennis racket and, and randomly hit a tennis ball and was like, point, you know. What actually happened was you saw someone, you know, and then you, and then you copied them. And it turns out that humans have built-in hardware for copying other people's actions. Okay, so if you do this to, and even some primates have it. This is, a, I think it's a baby spider monkey. If, a, if a someone sticks out their tongue, they'll stick, stick it out back. Okay. Um, and, and children do that too. Right. So, so we actually have built-in hardware in our brains for imitating things that other people do. And so the idea here is that maybe we can endow robots with the same capability. Instead of having to learn the motor skills from scratch, they can see someone else do them, they can use that as like an initialization, and then they can kind of say, okay, I'm gonna start that way and then I'm gonna learn uh, from there on. And there's actually some evidence that this is important to human intelligence as a whole. Um, so, so many motor control behaviors are extremely hard to learn from scratch, even if you have the reward function but they're easy to copy. They're so hard to learn from scratch that they're almost never invented. Okay, so it took half a million years to learn how to make fire, how to make fire consistently. It's half a million years, that's the whole population just rushing around randomly until that one thing happened, and then we all copied it. Okay. So, so the example I like to use from this is, um, is that you can think of a large population of people as performing a massive parallel search for new interesting behaviors, and then they copy each other's behaviors, and they kind of get saved in the population. So this is a thing called the Fosbury flop. Um, I don't, have you guys seen Paul, um, Paul Volting before on TV? You know the person jumps backwards over the pole? I always thought that was kind of weird. It turns out that that started in 1968. Ian Fosbury invented the Fosbury flop. Before that, for like however long people had been doing pole jumping, which I assume was a long time, people went over forwards. Okay, so this is the moment on TV where Ian, Fos, uh, Ian Fos, Fosbury he was kind of nervous, he was at a competition, and he thought he'd just try a new thing, right? Um, so, I'm looking kind of nervous. Does that thing athletes do where he, I don't know, he's being nervous and visualizing or something like that? Um, okay, a very tense moment for this, for this chap. He goes over backwards. That's the first time that it happened in public. Okay, so so this is what pole jumping looked like before that. He jumped over forwards. Right? Everyone else in that competition jumped over forwards. Fosbury was the first person to jump over backwards. 
And then, in the space of a few years, the entire sport changed to become like that. Okay? The whole, everyone who now does pole jumping does it backwards. So what happened there? A large number of people were trying to optimize something. Okay? They were trying to optimize something probably over a century. And they never, they never thought of that like slightly different way of doing it. They were all stuck in a local minimum. And then you had this one weirdo who was like, actually, I think I'm going to go over backwards. And he broke out of the minimum. And what does that tell you? That tells you even with lots of people trying to do something where a lot of money is on the line and they practice all the time, we're not very good at getting out of local money. And the way that we get out of them as a species is, is by imitation, by someone randomly does it and then we copy it. So I'm just going to show you a few videos because we don't have tons of time. I'm, I'm going through my time allowance. Just of um, some, some cases of learning from demonstration. Okay, so this is uh, some work I did with Scott Kindersmar. That's him in the shorts in the background there. He's controlling a robot with a joystick to get through like a little maze. It's got to push open a door and then go over there and push a button on a panel. So we're cheating a little here because the robot's actually experiencing the motion itself. This is called teleoperation. It's not like you see someone else do something. It's like someone guides you through a task. Okay. But then once, they've, once we've done that, you can take the task and split it into component motor skills. So these are now autonomously executed or for single demonstration. Push the door open you can um, walk up to the little dot and, and push it. Okay, so just a one demonstration, you can get an okay solution to this problem, and then you can apply reinforcement learning to make it better. So that's what that trajectory looked like. Here's this kind of robot going through space, and it being cut up, this demonstration being cut up into sub-motor skills um, that, can be, that can be reproduced autonomously. Here's another case, this is from Scott Neekham. Um, he is showing a robot how to fill in a census form. You can choose male, robot, or female. And he is showing it like it should grab the little thing, and then it should move its arm and draw a little X. <coughs> this is like teaching someone to write or something like that. Um, <laughs> but then you can move those, move those boxes around, and the robot can autonomously replay each component of that thing off a single demonstration. Not super well, it's a little shaky, but it does the thing mostly. Now there's multiple ways to do this. <coughs> when you're doing that segmentation, you have to make different types of assumptions. So in Scott Neekham's work, we assumed that each controller was linear and we broke it up into linear controllers. Uh, more exciting recent work um, from uh, a Pravesh Ranchot at Vitz um, is, uh, shows that you can extract the underlying reward function. So if you've heard of inverse reinforcement learning, it's the idea that you watch an expert and then you extract the reward function that the expert must have been optimizing. Um, Professor's work can take um, uh, can take uh, this segment and break it up by the reward function changing. So here you have a quadrotor going through hoops and then switching to avoiding the hoops and it will break it up into skills that way. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about that we're going to talk about tomorrow is hierarchies. Okay, so um, you've noticed that these are tiny little motor control things. You, are, you and I do not spend all of our day doing that thing in boxes. We actually have much longer range behavior that's much more complex. And the way that we think about that in reinforcement learning is through hierarchical reinforcement learning. Um, so, uh, so I have a, uh, a 25-minute slot tomorrow talking about hierarchical reinforcement learning. You should come to that because it's cool. I think it's cool. Okay, um, that's all I have. If we have any questions. Yes, totally, totally. So, so who is there to say no one knows that there isn't a better solution than the Fosbury flop, right? We just haven't found it yet. But in the situation where the best way to learn this is from someone else, that's kind of all you got. Does that make sense? But you are totally putting your own bias in here. Yeah? Now you can imagine a reinforcement learning algorithm learning that away. Um, uh, are 
you guaranteed work? You're not guaranteed, no. So policy search, one thing I didn't mention is generally speaking, policy search guarantees only a local optimum because it's a gradient method. And gradient methods generally give you only a local optimum um, unless there's like a strong constraint on the policy class. If the policy class is linear, you get a global optimum, but that's almost never the case. But I don't know that it's necessarily the case. It's reasonable to expect global optima out of, out of learning from motor control. It's just too hard. Humans definitely don't do it. That's why we all walk funny. Like everyone has a different gait. You know, it's because like you're optimizing for your body shape, but we all walk a little funny because you only get some of the way, and that's the thing we do all day all night. So I think I think global optimum too much to ask. Quanda and then no? So the question that I had was um, I think you mentioned that um, you can basically run away from this random behavior of like people's moving through and actually picking simple Mm -hmm. um, so I would say structured, not simple necessarily. Okay, so, so, okay, so structured policy class, right? Mm. Um, but um, so when you said that, I assume that you're not talking about implementers. Uh, yes, no. So um, what, um, what classes are you using? For, for example, if you're doing like the and other stuff? Yep. Okay, so the most common, the, the most successful one, and I think it's still more successful than the deep network policy classes is something called the dynamic motor prim motion primitive. And so what that is, is, is it's a combination of uh, three things. One of them is a shape that's like a shape that your arm should move through space. One of them is a parameters to a controller that stabilizes your arm around following that, that, that shape so it doesn't fly off the handle. And, and so, you know, the, the shape is like the shape that the arm is tracking, not that the arm is on. You know, you could have a shape like this and the arm is not going to reach it, it's just going to track it. Um, and then finally, you can have a goal that you can move around. So, um, so if you like trying to hit a tennis ball and the ball's over there slightly, to adjust the shape to hit the, hit the ball. And it, and that actually came out of studies of of human and amphibian um, physiology. Like it turns out that if you look at frogs, they execute behavior that looks very much like this. It's stereotyped in just that way. And so and it's really for tasks where things are dynamic. So like everything is moving fast, and you need to hit something with a particular force. Um, and, and you make instantaneous contact, like it's not like you are holding something and turning it the, the whole time, it's that you hit, hit a ball and it bounces away or you, or you grab something. Um, so the, the stuff that you saw with uh, Katharina Mulling and, um, and, uh, and um, um, Born in the string. Yeah, yeah, Born in Cup, yeah. So that is a dynamic motion program. It's, it's, it's an exactly classic case where, where you want to move the arm uh, through a fairly, fairly stereotype a movement in space, and you want to cause something interesting and dynamic to happen. Um, and DMPs are like, like up till, up till 2016, they would say almost. I would say almost every successful application of learning, maybe like 90% of them, of learning in robotics, of motor skills was a DMP application. And now the deep network stuff works, but it's unstructured and takes a lot of samples, and we haven't quite figured out what the right thing is. The DMP, yeah, the DMP is learned from data, um, but but it's but it's still a parameterized structured policy class. Uh, like for example, there's no way to get around the fact that there's a stabilizing controller. Stabilizing controller is there, and you you know, but you can change the parameters of the stabilizing controller. And there's no way to get around the fact that you're fo following a shape, but you get to choose what the shape is. That makes sense. Cool. Yes. Um, in one of the videos, you actually showed that um, I think it was one of the viewers from the controlling robots. Mm. Of the, the actions to choose, mm -hmm. broke down the traditions. Yep. What happens in a continuous situation where you're trying to do a new skill, but some of those trajectories overlap for a certain duration of time? Mm -hmm. Is it easy to then find different uh, skills at that moment? And what what is the threshold for the bot to consider, or the agent to consider a new skill? So, so the latest stuff, what it does is it takes all the trajectories together, and it tries to find a joint segmentation of all of them that gives you the minimum number of skills. Uh, with some like consistency measure. So the consistency measure that, um, that's in Scott Neekum's work is that each skill should be well described by a linear controller. And so if you had a complicated trajectory, you'd have to break it up into multiple linear controls. The stuff that's in Pravesh's work and, and, and Benjamin's my work is, um, is that the reward function has to be linear. The, the reward function that explains the behavior has to be linear. So um, when the underlying reward function changes, then you have to break the skill. But if you have a bunch of skills together, in a, it can kind of jointly segment them in, into something nice and sensible. So, 
Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the <coughs> learning from demonstration is supposed to avoid the the combinatorial explosion of learning something from scratch, but it doesn't avoid the combinatorial explosion of, you know, like if, if you say you're putting objects into boxes and they're n objects and n boxes, suddenly you 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 run into trouble, right? Um, so the way that we do that, or the way that people have thought about doing that, is they have. Uh, Portable representations. Where's Steve? Steve's over there. Um, uh, people are starting to think about how you might generalize picking up any object rather than this specific one and putting it in any box rather than this specific one. And the, and the, um, the mechanism that lets you do that saves you the exponential explosion in the number of things you have to dem demonstrate because the robot knows to generalize. If you say, I can pick this box up and put it there, and this box and put it there, and then it says, okay, any box can go there. Um, uh, but you have to, you know, you have to build in the intelligence for it to do that. So there are some that can do that a little bit, um, but not all the way there yet. But that's a great question. Did, did I, did I understand it correctly? Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, like, for example, like, uh, 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 mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, the, and the data doesn't contain the thing that lets you generalize. The algorithm has to generalize, right? It has to have some knowledge that lets it generalize. Yeah. Yes? Um, so, yeah, talking about generalization, uh, you put about uh, trying to uh, label different tasks. Mm -hmm. but, but then I was thinking about this about uh, two events where the group of representation for different kind of tasks that are not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. right? So, the kind of tasks you're doing is that we're like, uh, I can go to like different positions. And, uh, Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> I mean, a parameterized family of classes in family of policies, parameterized class of policies, in principle, already lets you do that if the class is flexible enough. So DMPs let you do a lot of stuff. But it's very hard to learn one policy that does all three of them, right? Uh, generally, we can't do that. So you have to notice that this task is different to this task. Create a new copy of the parameter trust family and then learn to set its parameters. Um, I, we can generalize, but only in a very limited way. So, so the way to think about it is if there's some parameterization, some parameters that you, like a, like a knob that you turn, and then the policy changes smoothly, then you can generalize. But otherwise, you, you can't, for, for learning the motor skill. For, for reasoning about the effects of the motor skill, you can generalize better. But for learning the motor skill, it's got to really very, very smoothly as a, um, inside the, the family of skills. Does that make sense? Sort of, OK. And maybe we can talk offline, because I think I'm running out. One more. One more question? OK. Any more any questions? OK. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Join Um, as he said, he'll be giving another talk tomorrow morning in the advanced RL session. So, um, 
Yeah, it gives me great pleasure to announce our next speaker as well, who is another very good friend, Dr. Nduvor Makondo, who is based at IBM in Johannesburg. And his background is undergrad and master's, was at UCT, the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Then he did his PhD at Tokyo Institute of Technology, and during that time I had the honor of working with him. And after that as well, when he was at the CSIR in South Africa, uh, say now he's at IBM, so he'll be talking about some of his work as well. Um, thanks Benji for the introduction. Um, so, I'm sure you guys enjoyed uh, the talk on uh, reinforcement learning. Right? So, I'll be talking about how to apply supervised learning or supervised machine learning for the control. We're trying to solve some of the similar tasks. So, um, so the agenda of my talk is as follows. Um, I'll give a brief overview to robot control uh, and give some motivation of why you want to use machine learning over some of the classical approaches. Um, and um, I'll give an overview of supervised learning approaches that have been applied over the past few years and some of the challenges uh, faced when you're trying to collect data from physical robots for control. And lastly, I'll talk about some of the work uh, being applied to like, um, address some of these issues. So when you, when you think about robotics over the past few years, you probably think of an army of robots in some factory performing some simple repetitive tasks. Yeah. Um, and um, this environment is fairly static and structured. So everything is designed around the robot, and the humans are sort of caged outside um, of this environment. Right? Um, so this consists of fixed tasks, um, steady objects, and um, there's very little variation of the tasks that the robots must perform. So this means that we only rely on human intuition and understanding of the environment in the robot to design control policies uh, for the robots to perform the tasks. But recently, we've um, sort of witnessed a migration of these robots to uh, unstructured environments and environments that are dynamic. Uh, for example, in agricultural robotics, um, and also drones for their delivery in uh, remote areas. Um, so this unstructured environments contains multiple tasks, moving objects, lots of variation of the tasks, which sort of motivated people to try to design systems that can learn and adapt um, uh, to, to unknown situations. So before going into how you applied uh, supervised machine learning, I'd like to give a brief, brief um, overview of uh, robot control. So the goal here is to control the joints of the robot arm uh, in, order, in order to perform the task using its end effector. And uh, the task is typically specified in this end effector uh, space, which is uh, intuitive uh, to humans. But control uh, takes place in the joint space. So this means we need functions to, trans to transform um, the task specification in the end effector space to the joint space for control. And there are typically two functions uh, required. So the kinematics which basically transforms the um, trajectories without the dynamics from the end effector space to the joint space. Uh, and also the dynamics, once you've got the trajectories in joint space, how do you predict the torques required uh, to, to control the robot? So I'll mainly talk about uh, dynamics control in this talk. So this is um, a widely used control architecture. Um, so the assumption here is that you have a desired trajectory of your robot in joint space. So this is the movement of the joint angles over time. And you would like to use a model to predict the fit forward command uh, that you must apply to the robot. So this is the torque in order for the robot to track the desired trajectory. In, practical, in practice, this model is not necessarily accurate. So you, you need to rely on the feedback controller in order to compensate for any errors and also stabilize the system. 
And typically this is a simple PID controller. Okay, so classically, um, there's a widely used model called a rigid body dynamics, which basically predicts the torque that must be applied. Actually, this vectors didn't come up properly. But anyway, so it's made up of different components that you must um, get from your, from your robot. So you've got the initial metrics, which basically determines the torque that must be applied um, to, to get a desired acceleration around an axis. You have the Coriolis metrics, you have the frictional forces, the gravitational forces, and the task based dis uh, dis uh, disturbances. So um, the success of this architecture relies on the accuracy of this model. Some of these parameters are actually difficult to get, such as the Coriolis metrics. Uh, there's no analytical formulation. Um, there's also the frictional forces. So in practice, you're actually not going to get a very accurate model. So this model relies on human insights into physics to come up with mathematical models. And it typically requires your know, link dimensions, the joint configurations, and the link masses. They do work well under certain situations. Um, when you have simple robot structures, uh, low speed reactive joints, and, uh, and also stationary and structural environments, as I mentioned before. So, however, they do lead to modeling errors, as I mentioned before. And there are some nonlinear factors that you know uh, um, incorporate into your model. And uh, the model that we actually get is static. So if your robot changes over time due to de degradation or weight, uh, your model doesn't actually adapt. Um, and also, most of the modern robots are designed to be soft and compliant uh, for human robot collaboration, which adds complexity to the modeling problem. Um, and also, since they, they interact with humans, it's difficult to anticipate ahead of time how the human is going to behave. So that is actually makes it difficult. So all these reasons led to researchers trying to use machine learning uh, is the, uh, as opposed to the classical control approaches. And here the goal is that, or the hope is that, we're able to come up with more accurate models since we are learning them from robot sensor data. And also that we can incorporate all the nonlinear factors from the data. Also, since we're learning from data generated by a robot, the models can actually adapt to changes to the environment and the, the robot itself. And um, this could also lead to an autonomous operation of robots. So the control architecture is similar to the previous one that we've seen, except that now we have a model that's actually learning in real time instead of a predefined static model. Um, so you have your desired trajectory, and you have a, a model that learns to predict commands to be applied to the robot and update, update itself over time. Um, so in, in standard approaches, the model is randomly initialized, um, so it makes poor predictions in the beginning. But over time, also it has to rely on the feedback controller to kind of drive it around the task it's trying to perform. And eventually, over time, it learns to generalize over the task. So this leads to a supervised regression uh, problem, where during training, the input is the actual trajectories of the robot and the output is the command that was actually applied to the robot. And uh, during testing, the input is the desired trajectory and the output is the predicted torque. But in this case, uh, training and testing happens in, in sequence, because given a, given a desired trajectory, you like to predict the torque and learn from the data that, that the robot generated. Um, 
but you cannot just apply any regression technique. So there's some criteria that you have to meet. So the first one is your model has to be able to learn online. So an incremental update is parameter as new data comes in. And the reason is that um, robots are typically high dimensional systems. So it's almost impossible to explore the entire state space to generate enough data to learn a global accurate model. And also you want to be able to learn complex nonlinear functions. And you, your model needs to be able to update itself fast. And you also need to make quick predictions in real time. So research in this space over the few years, past few years, was focused on how can we make non-parametric uh, non regression techniques fit this criteria. And uh, one of the approaches used is Gaussian process regression, which you probably have heard of it from the Bayesian talks. Um, but it's, so it's typically uh, characterized by a mean function and a kernel function. So the standard Gaussian process, when it makes prediction, it has to invert a huge kernel function, uh, meaning that its, co its computational complexity grows with a number of samples. So next I'll talk about some of the techniques um, being, uh, that have been applied to robotics to try and come up with fast model updates and predictions. So the first one is uh, based on the idea of locally weighted learning. So the idea is that you want to approximate a complex nonlinear function using locally linear functions. And this will be able to, 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 make, to make quick predictions using the linear functions. A simple example is that at each query point, you will find the k nearest neighbors of that and you feed a linear function. Then you use that for prediction. So the more advanced techniques incrementally build locally, local linear functions with the Gaussian kernel for computing distances. And at query time, you find a prediction for each linear model and the output is a weighted linear uh, sum of all the linear, uh, the, the linear models. So the second approach is based on data specification. So the main idea is that instead of using all the data generated by the robot, you want to intelligently select a few samples that represent the entire data. That allows you to do quick predictions. And this is basically uh, mainly applied for kernel uh, techniques such as Gaussian processes. So you, you receive the data stream from the robot and you select a few points. You actually have a, dic a fixed dictionary size that keeps all the data that you want to use for online learning. And you can actually use that size to determine how much computation you're able to do at each time. And uh, the, the, the trick is how to select this point. So a naive approach is to use random selection. And uh, this graph just shows uh, prediction for Gaussian process using all the data points in red and using different sizes of the dictionary. You can see that even when using only 12 points, you're able to approximate uh, the, the full Gaussian process. So, so far, we've assumed that you have data collected from the robot. But actually, in, in practice, it's actually very difficult to, to get data from the robot. And it's mainly because of the large state and action spaces. So this means that you need to perform trial and error for long periods of, periods of time in order to collect uh, training data. And this is unsafe for a robot, so you can actually damage your robot from this. Um, so next I'll talk about some of the work uh, being done in trying to address these issues. So the common thing uh, amongst this approach is the idea of using any available prior knowledge uh, to, to accelerate your, your learning process. So the first one which I've worked in is if you have multiple robots that are trying to learn the same tasks, instead of each robot learning from scratch, can we reuse some of the data the robot generated in order to accelerate learning for, for new robots? The second approach is instead of throwing away all uh, the 
mathematical models that researchers have come up, come up with, how can we combine them with supervised learning to accelerate learning? The third one is sim to real transfer. So learning simulation and adapt it, adapt it to, to, to a real robot. The last one is uh, meta-learning where you learn variations of the same tasks and optimize to do well on a new related task. So transfer learning, so this is some of the work that, uh, that I've done with, with Benjamin. Um, so the idea is uh, learn to adapt data between robots so that we can generate more data for the target robot. And this is particularly useful if you have um, a cheap robot that you can play around with and you have a more expensive robot that you don't want to try and break. So you can generate a lot of data from this robot and, and learn to adapt um, the data. So this is a transfer, actually the graphs are not coming up properly. I guess they're the two <laughs> different laptops. Um, so main, basically in transfer learning you have two domains. So you have the source domain. This is a domain where you've collected a lot of data, or you're able to collect a lot of data. And you also have a target domain. So this is where the domain where you have a new robot that is trying to learn its, its tasks. Um, and in the source domain, this can either be a robot or a human, in the case of learning from demonstration. Um, so the idea is to, how do you use source data to, uh, to accelerate learning the target domain? But in practice, the two robots could have different dimensions, which affects the dimensionality of the data, uh, could have also have different distribution because of the different leg masses. So for example, in order to track the trajectory using the PR2 robot, you may need a different top profile compared to, to the target robot. So the challenge here is how do you learn to adapt the data in the source domain to, in order to be useful in the target domain? Um, so the idea is learning a transfer model that you can use to adapt data to the target robot. So this is one way of doing it. So you have your source data, or your source domain, you have a target domain. The idea is collecting a few samples of correspondences between the two domains that you can use to learn a mapping from one domain to the other. In this particular case, because the, the dimensions of the data set are different, so you usually perform dimensionality reduction uh, process in order to match the dimensions, and then a mapping from the source to the target in this latent space. More recent work use approaches such as shared autoencoders or shared Gaussian process latent variable models. So I'll just show some videos showcasing uh, the benefit of knowledge transfer, where we're actually transferring from a cheaper robot to, to a more expensive robot. So here you can see that starting from a randomly initialized robot um, uh, model, the robot is just pe performing some random actions instead of uh, tracking like a star trajectory that has been specified. Then we can see that with knowledge transfer, uh, even from the first uh, trial, the robot is able to roughly track the star trajectory. So in this case, um, the robot has been given some prior knowledge transferred from the source robot and is able to use that to its benefit to start tracking um, the, the star trajectory properly. So another approach to try and accelerate learning um, is integrating domain knowledge. So in this particular case, you have a parametric model, uh, for example, the RGBD model that I talked about in the beginning. You also have data on the right generated by the robot. The idea is, can you come up with a hybrid semi-parametric -para model 
that has these, these properties. And one simple example is using a, so this, this equation is equivalent to a Gaussian process centered at the RBD model, um, learning to absorb all the errors uh, between the RBD model and the, and the sampled point. And uh, this has the ability that if your RBD model is accurate to begin with, the error term goes to zero. And when the robot moves to a different state space, um, then you rely on your RBD model to, to, to perform well. So the second approach is SIM to real transfer. So the idea is to um, you generate a bundle of data in simulation um, and then transfer that to the real robot. Um, so the first direction is try to build high fidelity simulators. The second one is, even if you don't have a high fidelity simulator, use transfer learning to adapt your models learned in simulation to the real robot. So the last one is uh, meta-learning, also referred to learning to learn. The main idea is to design models that can learn new skills or adapt to new environments rapidly with few training examples. And the idea is to extract information about the learning process itself um, to speed up learning for subsequent similar learning problems. So in this example, in this paper, you have variations of a task. For example, here you have a task of lifting Pringles and then we have a, a variation of lifting a heavier material, which is a, a drill. And you have a, a meta-learning that extracts the learning information about the learning process. In this particular case, this uh, memory of learning rates uh, for the neural networks parameterization of the task. And the idea is that if you transfer this memory of learning rates, you learn to do better in the, in the, in the subsequent task. Um, so for a standard gradient descent optimization, H is typically a constant, a hyperparameter that you tune using hyperparameter uh, search. With meta-learning, you actually parameterize H as a function of the gradient of the loss, parameterized with uh, parameter theta, and you learn to map from the, the task loss to the, um, to, the, to the learning rate. And the idea is that you do gradient descent step, few gradient descent steps on, on, on some sequent tasks. So in conclusion, I've shown how machine learning can be useful for, for robot control. Um, and uh, I've also uh, um, explored cases where machine learning is limited. And um, I've discussed some research that is, that is currently being done to address some of these limitations, um, which, so which is transfer learning, integrating domain knowledge, seem to transfer meta learning. And with that, I thank you.